from the Trek Table, your Sunday weekly podcast holding Trek space for Black, Indigenous, Brown, Women of Color, Queer or Otherwise, and your Alan. Hi, I am your host, Allison or Dela. Hi, I'm your co-host, Claudia. Hi, I'm your host, Maya. We're so excited for you all to join us today for this episode nine of the Trek Table, uh, recorded in front of our live digital audience, joining us here on twitch.tv slash outpost13. What's up to all our friends in the chat? See you from Germany, from London, from Boston, from Seattle. Thank you all for joining us, as well as the West Coast, the Left Coast. Uh, and thank you to our friends watching on outpost13.org, or maybe you're catching us on our audio podcast archive. Our opening track for this episode is titled Chicana Skies by the band Quetzal off their album Quetzal. You'll be hearing several tracks by Quetzal throughout this episode of Trek Table. Follow them at Quetzal Music on Instagram. See our show notes or the chat for a link to the mer their merchandise and store. Awesome. So welcome to episode 009 of the Trek Table. I'm your host and show creator, Allison Ordela. Thanks so much for tuning in and showing up for this conversation with women of color about Star Trek. We're jumping in to sit down and talk about episode eight of Star Trek Discovery season one. And in this episode, si vis pacem parabellum. I am not a Latin speaker in any uh, stretch of the imagination, but the, um, the scriptwriter who wrote this episode, Kristen Beyer, tr loosely translated it, it as um, that if you want peace, does that mean that you have to prepare for war? And um, I just want to say Kristen Beyer is one of my favorite Star Trek writers. She wrote Unification 3 in season three. So I was super excited to come back and revisit this episode. And really just, I just found it really interesting and relevant in this moment to think about what does peace feel like at a time when we might feel like we're at war, when we're literally still in wars, but also when we're surviving this war against this pandemic, you know, all the metaphors there. So we're gonna dig into the show today. I'm super excited. This amazing panel has come back to join us. Um, we're welcoming back two of our favorite uh, friends of the show and guest co-hosts. Um, and then first I wanna welcome back Claire Light, who's been on the show. She was on this uh, episode with us last week. Uh, Claire has worked in San Francisco's arts and social justice communities for over two decades. And we'll publish her first novel, Monkey Around, written under the pen name J.D. Jang this August. Super excited to have you back. Welcome back, Claire. How are you today? And I noticed you've got some blue on. Thank you, Dela. I am so glad to be back on Trek Table. And I am wearing Pavan Blue lipstick in honor of this week's episode uh, to match the, uh, the Pavan uh, aerial antenna here behind me. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. Welcome back. I'm so glad. And yes, for our audio listeners, Claire's got a great shot of the Pavin, uh, what would we call that? The Crystal Tower, the um, the audio the signal antenna. emanator. The antenna, yeah, that's the, the, the word. Yeah, the weird crystal antenna, yeah. Yes. Thank you for having that antenna and transmitter. Super excited. Welcome back, Claire. And thanks for having your Pavin Blue on today. We also want to welcome back to the show our guest co-host, Maya Mama, a.k.a. Maya Mills Lowe, who's a digital producer, podcaster, social justice activist, and administrative maven living in Tacoma, Washington. What's up to Tacoma, which is on the lands of the Puyallup people? We want to say what's up to all the... The Puyallup folks who are who were first there and continue to be there. I have a deep affection for that part of the country. Uh, welcome back, Maya Mama. How are you today? I noticed you've got some blue on too. I do. I'm so happy to be back. Uh, I am currently wearing the Pavan blue eyes. A little bright blue eyeshadow. That's for me today. Yes, yes. And as I mentioned in our prep, I got some some inquiries from our fans asking if you had Vulcaneers, white Vulcaneers on last week. Can you clear up that uh, current Trek Table community myth? Oh, it's just my headphones, really. They're just real big, uh, cover my ears up. Um, so, and I can see the confusion because last week my Afro was sort of absorbing a lot of the headphones, but no, there's just oh. headphone ears. 
from. Well, welcome back, and thank you coming for coming with your blue eyeshadow. I want to say welcome again to Claire, and we want to welcome all who enter. Whether you're a newbie just joining Star Trek from discovering Star Trek Discovery, or you are raised in a Star Trekking family, welcome. Let's build this space together. Whether you use Trek Table as your nerdy exploration or as a part of your self-care ritual, Trek Table is the weekly space to put down the world for a second and come into Trek Space. A space for Black, Brown, Indigenous women of color to be a fan, a geek, a nerd, and explore the vastness of the Star Trek multiverse. Trek Table is also a space for allies to come, engage, and explore as well. This is an opportunity for us as allies to hold space and focus for insights, perspectives, and experiences that we may not be familiar with. And now that we are all here, we'd like to remind you that we seek to build an environment of mutual respect. Uh, while it's enjoyable to disagree, there's enough hate going out in the world out there. So please keep your phasers on stun. Yes, yes. So as we dig into this ritual today on Sunday, we're recording this on Sunday, March 28th, 2021. I just want to invite you to plant your feet flat on the floor and go ahead and just take a breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. So we are going to go ahead and go check in. I know we had a chance to say hello to Maya Mama and to Claire. And I want to go and check in with Claudia, see how you're doing today. Can you share your name, pronouns, any access check in? Uh, and then I know you're wearing a little bit of blue. Can you talk about the blue? <laughs> and then to I add business on the business, your Trek, who or what are you holding Trek space for? Yes, yes, and yes. And I love that we all have like some costume stuff going on today. That is not usually a thing for a podcast. This is Claudia Alec. My gender pronouns are they, their, she, hers. You can use those interchangeably. My access check-in is that I am once again in the middle of a, some kind of a pain flare because of barometric pressure. So for those watching us, you might see me pull a face. I'm never pulling a face. It's something somebody said. I'm pulling a face because one of my muscles is pulling me. Although actually we might get into a conversation where I might pull a face. Who knows? Um, the color that I am wearing today, um, I am... Um, an african-american woman i've got this brown afro and i am rocking my disco t-shirt that says disco on it it's the same shirt that burnham wears when she's working out because i saw it and i realized well i definitely need that so i can work out just like michael <laughs> burnham it even has the things like the little little decals on the side i love this shirt and then i'm also rocking a gold um an actual gold insignia that was a gift when i was like in high school i've had this for 20 plus years and i love it and i am holding trek space for those, much like the, those who were on the deck of the Discovery when they were trying to save the U.S. Gagarin, I am holding Trek space for all those who feel that they are inadequate to an impossible task. Thank you. Um, yeah, lots of things going on. Thank you. I will acknowledge I've got my disco t-shirt on just like you. Um, I'm super happy to be a part of that. Um, so let's go uh, to Claire. I know we, ha we, we got a general welcome check-in with you, but I wonder, can you uh, do your check-in with us, name, pronouns, access needs, and who or what are you holding check space for today? Hi, everybody. Once again, I'm Claire. I use she, her pronouns, but um, I'm happy to take they, them as well if you forget. Um, my access needs are currently met. And um, this week, when a very, very large ship is stuck in a very, very small canal, I'm holding space for anyone who has very large feelings or thoughts or issues that can't quite fit into their small bodies or lives or um, processes. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, Star Trek, which has always been a space for me to process very large ideas, can uh, be a, a space for you to hold those things in if the rest of your life isn't large enough. Yes, thank you. Yes, hoping that they can clear the Suez Canal, right? That's what we're 
the very large ship. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, on to way to way to connect shipping and trek. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Claire. Um, I want like to wormhole, isn't it? it the Suez is. Canal is like our wormhole. Yeah. Very DS9 right now. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I want to say thank you for that as we transition. Uh, my mama, I want to invite you to check in. Um, sharing all of your check-in items and who or what are you holding check space for? Oh, thank you. I'm my mama. I use uh, she, her, they, them pronouns. And I'm holding check space for everyone who has to live in fear daily. Uh, it's very exhausting. And I'd also like to acknowledge that it is Passover. So happy Passover to any of our world family that celebrates and observes. Yes, happy Passover. Um, thank you so much. And I want to invite um, um, our resident Maya, Maya Chinchilla, to go ahead and check in. Maya, can I invite you to share your name, pronouns, uh, your access check in, and who or what are you holding Trek Space for? And I see you're in blue. All the things. Yes, yes. Um, I'm so glad to be back another week uh, at, at the table. Um, I have some blue and fuchsia with a little bit of gold, a little ravy um, eyeshadow. You see, because I wear also fuchsia colored glasses that now seem to match my hair. <laughs> so I've also got some uh, pink kind of crystal like earrings. And yes, uh, this sort of really rich blue because I, we all were just having a lot of fun um, looking at the beautiful imagery of the, the Pavo uh, planet. And I go by she, her, um, my access needs. Sometimes I, I'm a little wheezy. I try not to cough into the microphone, but uh, the last month or so I have been nursing some asthmatic reactions. Um, and this week I'm holding space for anyone who is challenging and fighting for voting rights, um, civil disobedience, pests, the ways we come together to take care of each other, and especially the current staff and students who are fighting tooth and nail for their uh, to keep the college um, women-centered and gender non-conforming centered on Ohlone land in Oakland, Mills College. Thank you. Um, Yes, and thank you for bringing in all of those things as well. Uh, I will check in last. Hi, everybody. I'm Dela. My pronouns are she, he, they, and Dela. And right now, I will say um, uh, I'm doing okay. I had a little pain earlier today, so I'm, I'm paying attention to that. And I would say that uh, my blue is also the shirt, like I mentioned, that Claudia has on. And um, I did a little hair highlight, so the blue in my hair right now is a little bit more vibrant, feels a lot like uh, Pavo, and um, in different light, looks like different shades of blue. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna welcome that and say that I'm holding check space for anyone who is trying to find peace in this time of feeling so much conflict, in this time of, of upheaval and in, and just trying to create peace for themselves in this whatever war you feel like you might be experiencing. Um, so I wanna say that. Um, I wanna hold up that in our chat, uh, some folks are holding space for the tech and we wanna um, say yes, uh, we are doing a live digital recording. Sometimes we have fun things and we thank everybody who's joining us and we're gonna ask our tech gods, uh, Mercury in particular, maybe to help us keep all the flow going. Uh, we invite our friends in the chat. So great to see all of you. Uh, who or what are you holding Trek space for today? And as we think about that, as we give space for that, we're gonna head into this musical break, which happens to be a little bit of the song 20 Pesos by Quetzal. All right, so welcome back to the Trek Table, episode nine. We are talking about Star Trek Discovery, season one, episode eight, CV Pachem Parabellum. Um, I invite folks to help me phonetically figure that out in the chat. I'd love to learn about that. Um, but we're going to pop into this episode a couple of different ways. We always do. We're going to explore it with popcorn recap. We're going to do Trek Table questions today. We've got some fun ones coming up. Claudia is going to help us navigate some discovery and design. Uh, Maya is going to walk us through the space runway. 
I'm going to help us braid it all together with thematics. We'll make sure to visit that spoiler zone so that everybody who's seen all the way through season one, two, and three of Disco uh, can have a chance to hear a little bit more chunk about what's going on in this episode as it connects to the full series. And then we'll do some signal boost, some really great, amazing things coming up. We're super excited um, about some shows that we're going to get to pump there. And then, of course, we've got final thoughts on this episode and some gratitude. Trek Table honors that people may be on their own journey of viewing Star Trek Discovery. So we'll also only discuss the things that we can remember have been unveiled up through this season one, episode eight of Star Trek Discovery. The spoiler zone later in the show is going to give that fix to friends who have seen Disco all, all the way through to the end of season three. Disco fans who are here on the rewatch, we got you too. You'll get a special treat after thematics. Awesome. So as we prepare to jump into the show, I just want to loop back and share. Here's what we're holding Trek Space for today. We're holding Trek Space for voting rights and protests and the way that folks want to come together, particularly folks on a lonely land in Oakland at Mills College, alums, students, um, staff who are fighting tooth and nail to keep their college. We're holding Trek Space for those folks who live in daily fear. And we also want to acknowledge that it's Passover. So we send uh, Passover greetings to folks around the world who celebrate this uh, holiday. Holiday. We also want to hold Trek Space for folks who have large feelings that feel like they're stuck in small canals. And anyone who has who has feelings like you have so many big feelings, but you can't let them out of your body. Or maybe we're also just holding Trek Space for that giant ship in the middle of the Suez Canal. We hope you get that turned around. We're also holding Trek Space for folks like the bridge crew who feel inadequate to an impossible task. And anybody who's seeking peace uh, amidst these feelings of war and how to create uh, peace within oneself. We're also holding Trek Space for uh, tech right now and for frontline workers who are trying to get it done. So with all these things and more, I just want to invite you to go ahead and take a breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. Thank you. And that brings us to our Trek table question number one, which will be posed to our Trek table assembled here in voice and video and those participating in twitch.tv slash outpost 13 chat. Our question is, I'm going to do a little, a little uh, act just to get you into it. Mr. Rees, can I trouble you to fire at something? There'll be time to grieve. This is not the time. That's Gabriel Lorca. Um, after the destruction of the USS Gagarin, having no empathy and being a very bad boss. So my question for y'all is, have you ever had to work with a bad boss? And how did you and what and how did you handle it? Did you handle it like Reese versus Lorca? Did you handle it like Tilly versus Stamets? Laurel versus Cole? Or Burnham and Tyler versus Saru? We would love to hear your vote and find out what it's like. And we're gonna listen to a little bit of Holland Beck Gonzo by the band Quetzal while you're letting us know your thoughts. <laughs> All right, y'all, this was us being like bad boss stories. So you had you had Lorca being real mean to Reese right after the Gagarin got they're like, hey, can, can I trouble you to fire at something? You had Stamets telling Tilly just to shut it on down. You had Call being a very bad boss to Laurel on several levels we'll get into in this episode. And Saru straight up tried to murk his staff. So y'all, how would you handle it when you've had a bad boss? Let's start with... Um, um, Claire, can, can I ask you um, what you've done when you had a bad boss? Who did you handle it like? I have done Reese. I have done Tilly. I have done Laurel. And I have done Burnham and Tyler. I've done them all because I've had so many bad bosses. Um, the one time I did a Tilly versus Stamets where I sat my boss down and was like, you're being, you're being kind of a dick. And... Um, and we need to, to, to process this and get through it. I got fired, so um, that was not encouraging. That was not super encouraging. But I did think it was, a, it was, an, interesting, um, it was an interesting note that during uh, an episode which was about 
the prelude to war or about a kind of being in the eye of the storm of a war, um, bad leadership is a theme. Um, and I think bad leadership is always a theme during moments of thought and planning in wartime. Um, we very, very rarely get to see great leadership in war and frequently from our point of view in, in the Western world, in um, the first world in America, um, we see great leadership in war on the other side. So, um, so I do think it's a, it's a really interesting theme to, to get at because we've all had to deal with poor leadership. It's just at the level of, um, at this level of tension, I don't know how many of us have actually dealt with bad leadership at this level of tension, at this level of life and death. Wow, Claire, you're, you're reminding me of um, an Octavia Butler quote. I love that I ask these very silly questions thinking we're just going to be giggling together. And then you 100% took me to college. I'm like, yes. No, this question is utterly tied to all of the things about how the world, I just thank you. That was amazing. Maya, bad bosses, who would you handle it like? Would you like, would you try to be like Tilly? Would you be like Laurel? How would you, what, what would you do? So normally, um, well, I, I've had also a lot of different bosses and I, and most of them have not been good bosses. And so I've handled it in every single one of those ways. Um, but generally speaking, I handle it like Reese and I just am sort of quiet because I think that there are just some people that you can't speak to because, uh, just because, uh, humans communicate in different ways. And I think that oftentimes it's a, it, it's sort of one of those, um, uh, yeah, it's just a communication type of situation. And I, I, I think that, uh, that, yeah, uh, Lorca sucks. <laughs> I'm not sure if I can that clear in my opinions, uh, and in any of the other episodes of Trek Table that I've done, I have a very low opinion of Gabriel Lorca. Did that trouble you to fire at something? Seriously, y'all. Seriously. All right. Well, like, it we is his fully. job. It's his job to tell him know. where to shoot. Thank you. Thank Sorry. you. What is Sorry. why is and also it's the middle of a battle. Why is he having all this attitude? You're completely right. You're completely right. All right, y'all. I, I need just a few more uh, data points so we can really figure out what, what's the best approach. Uh, although it sounds like sometimes you got to do a Reese. Sometimes you just got to got to do a Reese. Um, Dela, what do you think? What? How have you in the past approached this? Totally. And I just feel like I want to acknowledge visually for some of our friends. It's a live show today and Mercury is not being our friend right now. So we're doing OK. Um, thank you all for your love and patience. Um, and we're going to keep going. Um, but I will say this. I've had many boss experiences, but the one that feels most pressing, um, I feel a little bit like Laurel. I, I'm going to mm -hmm. say Laurel. Um, because it is deeply sad that that's all I'm gonna say, Laurel. <laughs> mm, exciting. Mm. Um, Satterfield says they've tried many methods, but nothing but brute force of will is generally the way to unfortunately get things done. Ultimatums have generally worked well for me. Mm, interesting. I, I also really loved hearing that the Tilly approach sometimes it works, sometimes it means that's not the space for you, and then you're you're working some other place. Mm -hmm. um, do we have uh, the um, results from our poll? I'm curious. And then I definitely want to ask Maya C um, how they would handle it. So let me first ask Maya C before we get to those results. Maya C, how would you handle it? Uh, I just want to say, yes, yeah, similar experiences. That's why I work towards never having a boss. But, you know, I've worked in everything from retail to academia to nonprofits and yeah. So I have a low tolerance for BS. Um, I have been Reese, you know, quiet and and I don't know if he's fuming, but I, I, I'm like, I need to say something, but I have a low tolerance for, for man yelling. And that could definitely push my buttons to become a Laurel and be like, I will get you. I will curse you forever. <laughs> um, I did once have a really awesome, uh boss who you know tried to make everything beautiful and we had even like morning yoga and stuff but that was one of my first nonprofit jobs and she sort of 
messed it up for me forever because I was, oh, not all jobs are like that. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. the good boss versus right. the bad boss. We can't all have a Picard. We all want a Picard. Mm -hmm. We can't all have a Picard. Um, I, okay, I just said opinions I have about, about captains, didn't I? Um, well, did. what was our, can we look at our poll results? What were the poll results? Um, I can name the, the poll results because I know yes, in the back yeah. channel we are. Yeah. Um, it looked like from the folks who voted, it was kind of a split between Reese and Lorca and Laurel and Cole. Oh, interesting. I like this. I like our audience. This means our audience is savvy and smart. And that mm -hmm. was the result of our Trek table question number one. And also, so much backstage drama, y'all. Folks dropping in, dropping out. The tech drama is hot today, and I'm loving it. And that was the end of Trek table question number one. Totally. And I'm just, as, as I talk through this next set, you know, I just want to say thank you so much to the fans who've been supporting us. We've been getting lots of really amazing love on the... Um, if responses from our newsletters, uh, directs Instagram and tw twit tweets to us, twits, um, tweets to us, <laughs> Filipino tongue coming in. Um, and I just want to give a shout out really quick to some of our friends who, um, who've been loving on us. We want to uh, say what's up to Cecilia and Amy, Kate and Diane, Colleen, Jill and Deb. Shouts out to Lulu and Luce and Tom uh, tuning in in Mexico. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, as well as all of our friends in the uh, Twitch chat. What's up, uh, Kate? Kate415, I see you. What's up, Calvin? Uh, Captain Calvin Cat? Thanks, everybody, for joining us and just being part of our fandom. And um, we're super excited that uh, folks are responding to our our request to have dialogue about Star Trek Discovery. So we, we just want to say thank you so much. And we always also want to say thank you to the Trek Table production crew who makes us look good, sound good, and promote all of our stuff. So we want to give extra love to Brandon and the crew today for all of the alls, as I like to say these days. Um, all the hearts and all the, also the Rye of the Dragon symbol, not to fully promote another franchise, but... Oh, yeah. Thank you, Raya. All right. So I did all that business. If you're not following us, um, you can find us on Instagram at Trek Table or at Twitter at Trek Table One. Uh, we would love you to join the conversation with us. Hashtag Trek Table, hashtag B-I-W-O-C Trek, and hashtag Star Trek Discovery. And that was the song Matanzas by the band Quetzal. We're so grateful to them and their collaboration and allowing us to uh, amplify their music. We want to give them much love. Uh, we also know from hearing that song that it is time for Popcorn Recap. Now, what's going to be hilarious about Popcorn Recap for us this iteration is uh, we keep having fun little inserts. So here's what I'm going to say. I'm just going to be completely transparent because we're live and it's fun. So... Um, I'm going to ask us to, yes, I see you, Chinese pirate, with your Kumandra. Yes, Kumandra. May the dragon come back together. That is always the hope. Um, so I'm going to say lovingly that maybe we can play Popcorn Recap and I can be in Popcorn Recap today. Love so it. That, Such a good idea. <laughs> yes. And I can even be named Claire if that helps us, Brandon. Um we uh, we're just I'm gonna visually acknowledge that yeah one of our one of our friends uh, w uh, dropped out so we'll get we'll get them back, um, but let's go ahead and thank you to our uh, artist coordinator Terry Hashimoto who happens to be on screen you look awesome yay to the blue jellyfish, <laughs> um, we're a, we're a team here we love it we love it, okay, um, so here's what we're so gonna do. Yes. So we're about ahead, to talk Claudia. about Star Trek Discovery Season 1, Episode 8. We're actually going to be doing our popcorn recap. Um, I'm hoping that Claire will beam in mysteriously in just a few minutes. But she's lost power. She's in another universe. So this is C.V. Pachem Parabellum, written by Kirsten Beyer, directed by John S. Scott. 
All right. And so we think that popcorn recap is funny because we try to tell chunklets of plot in two minutes. And it's funny because Maya is a newbie. And this is what, like the fourth time we've ever played popcorn recap. Uh, Claudia and Maya Mama were raised in a Star Trekking family and have deep uh, conversational experience with each other, I will say. And then... I'm going to pop in, and it's funny because, you know, I love minutia, so I'm going to just ramble. So we're going to try to see, and I didn't even play in the prep, so it's going to be even more fun right now. We're loving on it. Um, and I just invite us to send all of our love tech energy to Claire, and we're going to welcome you back, as Claudia said, when you get there. So we're trying to see if we can do this in two minutes. All right, Brandon, please set two minutes on the timer. Episode eight with two minutes on the clock. Can we get it done? Popcorn recap. All right, I'm going to begin. Okay, so the Discovery Discovery jumps into a a sector of space. USS Gagarin is being attacked, and they blow up. Everyone's upset. Stamets is acting super weird, and uh, he accidentally calls Tilly captain. Right, and then, like, Burnham and Tyler figure out they could go to, well, Burnham figures out we could go to this planet called Pavo. We could use it because it has this natural occurring transmitter. So Burnham and Tyler and Saru set off to Pavo. It seems to be uninhabited, and and yet there's some kind of vibrational experience going on because they want to create a way to develop sonar to fight the Klingon cloaking. And then we're on the sarcophagus again, and Laurel, Cole greeting him, comparing him to Takuvma, but Cole's like, I don't like that. Demises and says that he doesn't want to be like all the doesn't want all the Klingons to be together under him. He doesn't want harmony and unity. He just wants to sh- her to show her value beyond just loyalty. And so Laurel offers to interrogate the prisoner. Uh, 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 okay, so then back on the blue planet, Pavo, Burnham and Tyler and Saru, they discover that there's actually, um, um, there's aliens, there's like floaty aliens on it, and like Saru is like trying to talk to them, and, ooh, and then later, Tyler and Burnham kiss. Ooh, ooh. Back on Discovery, <laughs> Tilly gets him <laughs> to admit that he's like super, uh, uh, being weird and stuff, and he says that he can't really tell what's going on with with uh, reality, but he can't tell his husband. And then we go back to the sarcophagus, this death ship, and Lorel collaborates with Admiral Katrina Cornwell. So they, so then that they can both escape because Cole is against Lorel. Straight up, he bad. Mm. And then Saru gets all like symbiosis orgasm. Ugh. Ah, all right. <laughs> Alas, good try. Oh, alas, alas, we have uh, lost our time. But um, I believe that we should hear the end of this story. This gives us time for one more thing, and I have good news. Claire has beamed back from the other planet. Um, it was a transporter malfunction. Claire is back. But let's let's go back to you, Dela. You were in the middle of telling us something, and we're in the middle of the story. What happened? Just one more Saru thing. had a harmony orgasm, found symbiosis, and <laughs> connected to the living spirit of Pavo. And then he like kind of gets empathy dramatic and like breaks the phones and tries to trap Burnham and Tyler on the planet to achieve peace. Um. Uh, 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 what Should I do one, yeah, please, do, do one more? Yeah, please do one more. Do one more. Uh, Laurel, Laurel fakes the fight and pretends to kill Cornwall, drops her body off at the Klingon morgue, is that what that is? And sees a lot of her friends dead, and they all have the same outfits, um, and she promises revenge on Cole. Totally. And then so like Tyler's like, Saru, tell me about all of your feelings. And then finally Saru's like, you're trying to trick me. And so then um, he like runs so fast and um, totally beats up uh, Michael Burnham, but she finally makes the machine work and they send off a signal. Right. And so then uh, General Cole is, he's like all like, okay, Laurel, like you can join me and we're going to be like pals and stuff. And then he puts like red paint on her face to like, and makes her kneel. And then he's like, psych. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Dang. And, and then can I add the last? So 
then back on the planet as Saru is like getting all desperate, like breaking the old school laptop that Burnham has plugged into the crystal tree. The Povins are like, wait, this is not what we want. We want harmony. And so uh, they release everybody and back on Discovery, Saru has some big tears about feeling guilty for 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 having this whole empathy a harmony experience and how it, it violated his uh, goals as a Starfleet officer. So he apologizes to Burnham and to Tyler. And, and Claire, now that you're back, do you want to give us the last, the very last thing that happens? Just the last yes. thing in the episode. The Pava life forms adjust the signal to, um, but not in the way the Discovery wanted them to. They adjust the signal to contact Starfleet and Klingons both. And then um, all of a sudden, Cole is on his way, and now the Discovery is the planet's only defense. Oh, thank you um, dun, for, dun, for, dun. for one of the most dramatic. This, I don't know if this was the most dramatic uh, popcorn recap, but this was one that had a lot of ins and outs. It was very exciting. And I'm letting our listening audience and our chat audience know I will not be reading your Stargate One jokes aloud. I'm resisting it. <laughs> <laughs> And if you want to get an act by act breakdown, uh, you know, the four acts of this uh, amazing episode, we want to amplify. You can visit our friends at Women at Warp. Uh, also, Memory Alpha has a really great uh, recap, but theirs often has spoilers. So for the non spoilers, we amplify Andy at Women at Warp. She took the time in 2017 to go ahead and uh, give us this recap. And uh, we'll put that link in the, ch in the Twitch chat and also in our episode notes for those of you listening on the podcast. Welcome back, everybody. Let's dish on our design elements that are giving us all of this amazing drama. Um, I think I'm just going to do a little bit of uh, naming cool things and asking you to tell me about them. I was feeling the space battle. It was very colorful. Yes, and I really was surprised at how comfortable Lorca is in being like the biggest ship in or like the essential ship in the arsenal and how much he really does like popping in and killing everybody. That was real. Did you notice that the lights on uh, the their ship were red, white, and blue and then the bad guys were green? Like there seemed to be like some color themes going on. Uh, I did not see that. I need to watch that in the rewatch. Yeah. Uh, what about the um, the Pavan planet? It's so pretty. Do we have opinions about the design of our Pavan planet? It is the disco rave planet. It's it's very like you know you get in there and you're like, oots, 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 oots. <laughs> you know, and and if you look at the you look at the transmitter, the crystals there, they're very like fool's gold looking until you get up close and you look at the sky through them, and then they're very like, ooh. It's a little traditional, um, uh, the original series Star Trek, TOS Star Trek. Um, then the, and then there's the, you know, the, the, the amorphous Pavan beings who are very like, um, like a, a video that you would see at a rave. And uh, everything is really, really designed. And then, and then when you get into the disco yurt that they spend the night in, of course, yes. of, of course shit happens in the disco yurt because it's a disco yurt. It's got those disco lights and, uh, and you're inside and you feel like you're in a um, chill out space at a rave. I, I'm only just now having this huge light bulb moment of being like, I think I saw that exact yurt at Burning Man. That's amazing. I also love that they designed it to seem like it was natural. Like on that planet, that planet just naturally grows buildings and uh, and signal towers. What a convenient planet. Um, um, uh, did folks have uh, oh, right, any other opinions about the planet? So all I want to say is just the tech tip. Uh, as folks watch the episode, did you notice that once the other thing that came out of Burnham's backpack was like a, a telephone looking device that she actually hooked to the crystal tree as a way to send <laughs> and receive signal. So I saw I saw that Discovery designers, I, I, and I love it because I was like, of course, at that time period in the in the Trekness, 
I, I would expect a phone to appear. So thank you for the old school phone. That's amazing. Yeah. And that, that thick PC looking uh, contraption that they must have been carrying in their backpacks. Uh, that reminds me, I was like, does it look like the very first Apple laptop or just yes. kind of PC or maybe maybe on off brand at all, right? It was just look really thick and clunky, but I guess it does a lot of work. Um, but I, I do have to say um, the planet itself and the philosophies and, and what Saru was trying to interpret and the and the way that they were trying to figure out if it could actually communicate and the language and whether it was a language they could even understand it gave me very much um a, a sense of of how i've learned from you know native folks of many any land whose relationship to all living things and also arriving in a place mm -hmm. and not necessarily knowing the language uh and and what to do in in of a a setting right that you can't necessarily just come in and take things uh you have to figure out the what what is the language and how how to communicate and how to respect um the relationship between the earth um you know and and all the living beings in its in its realm oh that's so useful maya i mean i i feel like that was my michael burnham was saying on the planet she was like prime directive directive time we can't do we can't use the tower without consent we have to get consent i don't think the original prime directive was about consent but i like to think of it as consent culture um do we have any uh, uh, let's just wrap up real quick do we have opinions about the um ship of the dead the sarcophagus so like this is the ship that we started off on like takuma's dad made this ship this was the family ship right and then the family like they were like i guess like the family was dark nobody was like using the ship takuma got the ship made it better made it actually the best ship and it had like um um uh, the 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 way it could ghost itself and and become invisible um, what are your opinions on this uh, ship of the dead now that it's in the hands of coal? Yeah, I just want to, I'll jump in really quick. Uh, I think one of the details I found, I pulled a visual that we're looking at of Laurel walking down a hallway towards uh, Cornwell's uh, cell. And I, it just had that another moment touch of Alice in Wonderland and just feeling like she's coming out of a rabbit hole. Um, and I just, I really appreciate how we're still getting notes of Alice in Wonderland and what that means and how it's kind of the world is upside down. So I just wanted to say like, that was a fun design thing. And it's such a beautiful, like the floors are always beautiful. Like it's a really beautiful restored ship. It seems really decorative. Like I, I hadn't thought of Klingons as being people who had an arts practice. And that ship mm. makes me think, wow, the Klingons as a people <laughs> are making sculptures. They're making gorgeous outfits. They are, they care about the they care about what their ship looks like. Mm -hmm. It's that's an interesting take because um, very baroque for me. For me, the the original Klingons in the in the original series were um, were an analogy to Russians. And uh, there, there was a lot of quaffing and kind of, kind of medieval sort of Slavic kind of stuff going on with the Klingons. And then in um, the next generation, they started very deliberately um, pulling the Klingons towards uh, East Asian uh, cultures, um, with with a lot of a lot of kind of Genghis Khan stuff going on, but also a lot of uh, meditation, a lot of traditional uh, martial arts. Um, that sort of thing. And so um, when you start pulling towards East Asian cultures, you start pulling towards ancient cultures and ancient art forms and that sort of thing. And in DS9, I think the way that the, the direction that they were pulling the Klingons in, the, in there was like a very, very rich backstory, very, very rich um, culture uh, behind them. And in, in, um, in Voyager with Bolana Torres, you see a lot more of their religion and their um, their spirituality. So um, I guess, like, if maybe if you aren't a deep canon, <laughs> you don't think of the the Klingons as as uh, as being very very arty. But I thought that this was very much um, in the continuum of what Treks have been doing with the Klingons all along. Um, I could talk about this all day long with you, Claire, because yes, please keep bringing me that deep canon um, observation. So beautiful. Um, are there any, I want to make sure there's room for any last observations before I close us out. Any last observations? 
beautiful. Then I'm going to take us to the end. And next week we get to talk about more and different exciting discovery designs. Yes, yes. And thank you all for being in the chat. What's up to Bin Cortana, Captain Calvin Cat, A10, Chinese Pirate, Commander Root, Doc Zulu, E-Rabs, Fleecer, Ice Wizards is here. What's up, Jess Queen One, Kate4415, LJ Lacard, Lurks, Maya Mama, NoCal in SoCal, Satterfield H, Soul Hunter Art, Soul Hunter, hmm, Tom Toms, <laughs> I believe, V and K and Virgo Praz. And I just want to, yeah, I just want to give love to all our friends who are on the Twitch. And if you're watching us on Outpost 13, we tweet us or Instagram us because we want to give you love too. Um, and if you're not part of this community and you want to join us, you're listening us to us on the audio podcast on either Spotify or uh, po uh, Google Podcasts or uh, iTunes Podcasts, Apple Podcasts. If you're listening to us and you want to figure out how to engage with us even more, we welcome you to visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash trucktablepodcast. <sighs> and before we go into our musical break, I'm going to share with you truck table question number two. That is, what would your reaction be to an instant hit of no fear, just like on the Pavan planet? <gasps> Everyone, can I just tell you that Hollenbeck Gonzo is my new Get Hype song? I really, really enjoy it. So our question was, if you, like Saru, had just landed on this planet, the planet Pavo, and you got hit with this instant hit of no fear, what would your reaction be? Because we see at the end of this episode, Saru having some really deep feelings of remorse for all of the wild stuff he did. I'm just curious, how would you react if you, if you got an instant hit of having all of your troubles disappear. Um, I'm going to start with Maya, Maya Mama. Maya Mama, what do you, how, how would you react? So um, I would, I feel like it would be extraordinarily fr uh, freeing, um, but also I know me and I know that I could figure out a way to make the whole experience scary again. <laughs> Tell it. <laughs> 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 what do I do now? I'm not afraid of anything. <laughs> Claire, um, what would your reaction be to an instant hit of no fear? Well, um, I, I was thinking about this, and I was like, you know, I don't, I don't experience fear a great deal. And then I realized, you know, I'm an adult human being. What we all have to do as adults is learn how to subsume our fear um, and compartmentalize it so that we can function. And um, we do that, you know, depending on our personalities and our experiences, we do that to the extent that um, in, in my case, I typically don't experience fear ever on a daily basis. I just, I just never experience it. It's only on very special occasions. Um, so I, I, think, I think it would be a very, very strange thing because uh, that fear would have to be like pulled out from underneath you, pulled out from your subconscious. And um, and I think it might be why um, Saru comes across as so incredibly childish um, in the way that he addresses his fear throughout the series or throughout this season at any rate, um, because he is fear forward. And, um, and human beings are taught uh, by life or by parent or by society to, to subsume or and, and compartmentalize our fear so that we can function and so that we're not constantly fear forward with each other. So I, I have really no idea what that would feel like because I don't, I don't know what it feels like to live with fear in a, at a conscious level constantly. Maya, my, uh, uh, Maya Chintia, how would, how would you react? Um, yeah, I'm just sort of, I'm like in awe. I don't know what that's like, um, Claire, but I, as a kid, I super leaned into my own fears and I was like, it was, I was afraid of something. I was like, this is an opportunity to learn or to, to jump forward. 
But later in life, I'm like, my first response was, I've taken those drugs. You know, um, I've actually, uh, and I, I wish maybe that I had partied with drugs, but I've been in a, I've, I've been in the hospital, you know, and I was pumped with all kinds of like anti-anxiety medications and other like uh, pain blockers. And there was this one time in particular that was so magical. I felt like I was flying through the hospital back to my room and I was, you know, my, my, uh, family was a little freaked out, but my friends were having a great time with me. I wanted to order everything <laughs> from the, from the cafeteria, I wanted a party to happen in my bedroom. It was so awesome. And I remember that and I, and I'm grateful for those drugs. So, um, I, and I just, I think I would get so much more done if I wasn't, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a ruminator for sure. I'm an anxious kitty, but Luckily, you, it makes people you, laugh, apparently. <laughs> you, you fully had the Saru experience, and you were fine. Like, we, we, we've just heard the story of you're a very balanced person. You experienced what Saru did, and you were able to come back. And that's a gorgeous thing. Um, at Dela, what would your reaction be? And I'm trying really hard to not read the massive, amazing text that is coming from our audience. Y'all are killing me. It's so funny. Yes to all of your Dune references. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes to mm -hmm. all of them. Yeah. But I'm remaining. We are here in Star Trek. Dela, what, how would you react to No Fear? Uh, I, I think I would probably go a little, I, my, my, my initial reaction is like, buck wild. I don't even no, like, and then I read like people wanting to murder hornets and wasps in our in our in our chat, and I would say I don't want to murder hornets and wasps, but I would probably without fear, I'd I'd be like I want to go and help root out white supremacist cells, and I want to go figure out how to like battle folks who like need to have some correction in in the world. So, um, so I think that's what I would want to do is like. I, I find myself to be a pacifist, but in this moment, I was like, but if I had no real fear, I think it would be, yeah, I want to battle the the baddies right now. Oh, wow. Okay, that's that's amazing. So I had put down as my initial note, New Jack City. I was like, Claudia, Alec, you would be, if you could put down all your burdens and be without that, I think that I'd become a fiend. I'd become a fiend and I'd be on the streets trying to get those blue leaves or those blue sparkles, whatever it was that was giving that sweet, <laughs> sweet release of, you don't have to worry about everything. We don't have to stop the war, the universal war. I think I'd be into that. But now that I've heard your response, Dela, I would like to think that I would actually feel the peace and then be able to do all of the beautiful labor because I felt that peace. That's amazing. Ooh, be ready for the yes. war because of mm -hmm. that peaceful action. Thank you, Dela. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, do you want me to share any of what's going on in this chat or? <laughs> if we have time, please do. Yeah, I mean, I just want to hold up that there's some conversation. Uh, Jedi Branch is saying they would murder hornets. Uh, Captain Calvin Cat is like, I'm afraid. I don't want to murder hornets. I'm afraid of murder hornets. So we're just having some dialogue about wasps and and hornets. And I want to acknowledge in our natural world, those those creatures provide key things. So I don't want to advocate for them going away. I support the ecosystem no, 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 of no. hornets I, I think and they're wasps. Talking I think they're talking about <laughs> murder hornets, not not murdering hornets, but murder what hornets. What is that? Those, the th Asian those, those giant like the, hornet. Yeah, the, 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 at the very beginning of the pandemic, they were they were coming in through Canada or something, and oh. they, it was a big story for about five seconds until people started dying. But they were in my area. Yeah, I was like yeah. another thing. Yeah. Okay. Like, so, yeah, it's scary. And they are murdering people. They're murdering bees. That said, though, our audience is hilarious. Also, again, fear is the mind killer. Well done, yes, audience. Fear is a mind killer. But, I will not right. fear. I but must that, not that fear. brings us. That yes, exactly. Yeah. We must not How fear. I, I almost read the entire quote. You are the best audience ever. Um, but that brings <laughs> us to the end of our trek table question number two. You are amazing. But now is the time in our ritual where we invite everyone to move around in their seats and screens because now it's time for the trek table dance break. Yes, space runway. <laughs> Some of the eye-catching looks from function to fashion in the 23rd century. Space, 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 space runway. Welcome to Space Runway. This week we are doing some highlights from Season 1, Episode 8. And there's also 8 looks today. 
Uh, look, number eight, the spirit life force of Pavo. Whatever this being is, it is definitely a look. It's a planet. It's an energy. It's its own natural tones. And poor Saru's over here overstimulated and says all they want is to be known. Not necessarily a language, but those beautiful blue leaves vibrate with a specific tone. That music modifies the electromagnetic signal sonar that gathers among the trees. Watch out, friends. It's going to take over and give you harmony. Or maybe that's because of Saru's fears. And look, number seven, away mission backpack. Now, this is our first time seeing such big bags on an away mission. They seem to attach directly to the away mission vests with no straps. Looks like it might be a sleepover. What you got in there? A toothbrush? A thick ass laptop to connect to Pavo's transmitter? Food and sleeping supplies? Looks like you're ready for the long haul. <laughs> That's right. Look number six, crystal tree in space. Look at this naturally existing transmitter on Pavo, giving us rave-like feels. Like, let's gather around the crystal tower with our glow sticks in harmony. But wait, we need your natural technology to battle against the Klingons. Can we borrow it? <laughs> Look number five, Saru running in heels. Long, lanky Saru in a sleek away mission jumpsuit looks like a blue gazelle in gaga heels, sprinting Ooh. faster than we've ever seen before to protect his inner peace. Poor baby has never felt this kind of calm before and doesn't want to leave Pavo. We didn't know you had it in you, Saru, but you're looking for doing it. Look number four, Cornwell and Laurel scream it out. Shout, shout, let it all out. These are the things women scream about. Okay, so come on. Rarely do we get to see two women warriors screaming at each other, if only to distract the guards outside the door. At first, Admiral Cornwell didn't get it, but Laurel helped to get her going so that they create a space so that Laurel could say, I want to defect. Let it out, ladies, let it out. <laughs> <laughs> number three general cole in leather and gold gold plate gold neck plate peeking out from his leather and gold shoulder pads detailed with admiral stripes and, and spikes a crest in the middle of his stomach for house goal and don't forget that Mar x marks the spot with that red face paint that he must apply each day with his own fingers don't mistake him for a fallen idol He's got swag and sinking cling on supremacy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Look number two, Lieutenant Commander Cyborg. Who's that girl? Lieutenant Commander Arium looks like she's seen some things. Metal side plates go across her face, connecting to white and silver helmet. Is this an augment? What is her backstory? I want to know. For now, we all all we know is that she keeps communication with Stamets from the bridge as a spore drive ops officer. And look number one, mainlining spores. Daddy Culver made a better outlet on Stamets forum to mainline the spore drive, avoiding any more blood and tardigrade mammograms. We also get an up-close look at the way the arms are revealed via sleeve zippers. Ooh, and top of the jacket also, uh, the uniform silver matches the pants, plus pocket zippers. Be careful of all those jumps, stamets. And that's Space Runway for this week, fashion, form, and function in the future.
Thanks for all that love in the chat. And if you're having a great time with us and you want to keep helping us hold Trek space for women of color, maybe put some more money towards our tech, we want to say thank you and welcome. Come on, join us at patreon.com at the Trek table. Um, you know, today's show, I think, is just indicative of like what it's like to be on an away mission and just trying to make it happen. And I just want to have us use this time in thematics to kind of braid together all of the insights and the reflections that we've been able to bring up about this week's episode. We've been saving a couple of chunky convos for this section so I want to give us a chance to jump in and then like always we'll finish thematics with that spoiler zone so here we go we're on Pavel we, we've, we've seen Saru run in the Gaga boots we've seen the alien without a body I was super happy that they did a non bipedal species this week um, and it was also really I think profound to see this 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 title of this episode and I think I heard you say C Vici Pachem is that what you said Claudia um, that to hope for peace but prepare for war could you say it in in Latin again oh I got I got like a C in Latin so I just said it real oh. confident like I knew what I was talking about but I don't know how to pronounce that <laughs> I believe you I believed it I, I I believe black women all the time all the time um, <laughs> however you gonna say it I'm gonna believe you. <laughs> I'm here for it. Yes, Michael Burnham, yes. Um, so yeah, I just want to say that. So let's let's check in about this. Like, there's so many different moments of people seeking peace. Um, I want to talk about this moment with Saru, Burnham, and Tyler, because we see Saru kind of experience his Kelpianness in a whole new way. Um, thoughts about Saru and his arc? Uh, that pa the end of the sh of the show where he's got all this grief and guilt about how he acted on the planet. Uh, Maya, Mama, I wonder you have thoughts that you want to start us off with. So um, I always I think that Saru is someone that uh, seems very logical. He seems logical, but his choices are all based on emotion. They're based on fear, and that uh, it, it was it, it's very similar to him being high and being unable to control his own emotional process. Um, perhaps this uh, is an experience that will prepare him for the future, but. Um, but I was also happy to see Tilly um, is really becoming a person that Stamets can trust. Um, mm -hmm. She's super awkward, but she doesn't back down. Like she's she's awkward, but she's and and she appears shy, like she kind of characterizes as shy, but she's not really shy. She when uh, she knows when to back off and when to not back, and 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 uh, she knows that friendship takes work to tr to to build and i am i'm all for uh tilly's uh emotional maturity mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh claire wondering your thoughts here uh lots of good juicy stuff going on well um like i said before about saru's journey um you know he does come across as very childish uh because he behaves in ways that humans have learned uh to compartmentalize but um I also think that um, that there has to be something about the way that the Pavans messed with his mind that really took him out of himself, not just took him out of the fear, but took him out of himself um, because he was really behaving out of character. And the moment he got off of Pavo, he realized his mistake. So um, I think it's not just a matter of, of peace, but um, rather that peace is not a, um, a state of mind that any of us is used to. And perhaps it's not a state of mind that any of us could possibly get used to because the existence of other people creates conflict. And so mm -hmm. being placed into a position of absolute peace creates a, a whole new fear um, out of, out of, thin air, and that's the fear of the loss of that piece, which is what Saru was responding to. So Saru didn't really get, he, he had a, one orgasmic moment of peace, and then he was right back into fear, and he was reacting to that again. So um, so it's it's this weird kind of, um, uh, kind of catch-22, where if you get real peace, you'll immediately break your own peace with your fear of losing it. And, um, and I kind of, I kind of think that that is would be a very human trait even though Saru is not supposed to be human mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Claudia, I see that visual you're doing uh, nods on the nose. Does that mean you were agreeing or did I just misinterpret a twitch? This was me just 100% agreeing and having nothing more to add just because y'all just said really good things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna then jump to Maya. Um, see, thoughts about Tyler Burnham? Um, I know we had kind of talked about their reaction to Saru. Yeah, um, I, I just, you know, that whole, um, there's these moments with Tyler that are like, it's like we've talked about it, it's kind of sexy, but also he keeps jumping in to help Burnham in these ways that, that you know, it helps with the dramatic tension, but but there's like that power dynamic there that's giving me, like, it, it makes me feel weird at, at some points because you know burnham is knowledgeable she has a lot of experience and we still don't know a whole lot about tyler except that he's you know experienced some trauma and but he sort of just jumped into this like leadership role the security guy role and you know there was a, another moment i think like last episode where he kind of jumps over burnham to be like oh yeah you know telling Lorca she did what she was supposed to do or or maybe that was this That's I don't know I feel like there's episode. there's a yes. couple different times I'm thinking of mm -hmm. yeah so um so yeah that's that's the one thing I just keep thinking about um, in that dynamic and and that you know she's also leaning into that like not having to to know it all either so so I think they're playing with that dynamic but I'm just I'm like what do you mean you're 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 a higher up just because you have a certain amount of stripes that I no longer have, you know, I had a I had a defensive moment <laughs> when that mm -hmm. happened. It's true. And you know, honestly, that's how it works in Starfleet, you lose your stripes, you lose your rank, you have to follow who's in charge and Tyler pulled rank in a way that I did not expect. Um, and I'll just say like, I really appreciate this episode being able to see this dynamic play out not just with Burnham and Tyler and but also Saru and I felt like part of his crash at the end the emotional release that i feel like we saw in the medical bay was him also having grief or even when he's on the planet and he's like screaming at burnham about like you take everything away from me that's all you do is you take i'm like he's still grieving Giorgio. and even though he talked about it a couple episodes ago i just it, it reminds me that grief is a process it reminds me that yes we can healing is a process right we can still we can think we have healed and then something occurs and it can trigger us or it can remind us of those feelings. So I'm just kind of holding space for that. And I'll just say this episode, this these moments with Tilly and Culp and Stamets, I see her trajectory. I just want to point out again, Tilly took the initiative, just like you were saying, my mama, like Tilly, Tilly sees her path from cadet to captain. And I really, every time we see little moments of her just kind of stepping into herself i just really am enjoying all of that so which kind of leads me to my next question unless claudia you have something you want to say I, before i go I, I had a real quick thing which was this was why i um had reese versus Lorca and mm. tilly versus stamets i was like these are both people who got shut down by their boss really hard one person was like i guess i'm just gonna take it and i'm a bad person and that uh well spoiler alert i'm not sure if that character becomes a character that we follow a lot in the in the following seasons tilly mm -hmm. we follow i'm sorry i spoiled something for y'all that's okay <laughs> reese is still there we, you know some of us follow him on periphery like like we learned on star trek from the olden times um, I guess the original series. Um, all right, so here, I I'm gonna jump to this question. This is one of our fun questions and thematics today. There was that kiss though. And I wanna know to the Trek table mm. assembled and I'm asking the oh. Trek table in the chat, <laughs> which kiss did you prefer? The Pob and Hut or the dance party kiss? We're showing the Pob and Hut kiss, the back end of it. Um, yes, Claire, I'm gonna go to you first, your opinion. Dance party kiss, Pav and Yurt kiss. One hundred percent dance party kiss, and I don't know how anybody can say anything different. I mean, that th there was Al Green <laughs> playing the Astrid and dance, and there was it was kind of awkward and kind of hot, and they neared each other and da 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 da, and he pulled her close and he said, "Oh, what the hell? You're not going to remember this anyway." I mean, it was just like you know, it was it was a traditional first kiss. 
but it was also like in my favorite episode of Discovery so far and there was all this tension and they were trying to save the 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 the, the ship and they were trying to save each other and I I don't know that one just does it for me. It does it for there me. There you go. Thank you, Claire. Yeah. My mama, I, I, we might have a little disagreement going on. You tell me. Pavin Yurt, party kiss. Well, I say this with, with all kindness that I do disagree with you, Claire. <laughs> I am 100% Pavin Yurt. The party kiss, it was the party kiss. Now, I'm not saying that party kiss wasn't sexy and that with that Al Green and that it wasn't hot, but that Pavin kiss was hot because of the, you know, intimate surroundings, all the blue and dark glow, and Tyler's all big Dom energy where he's like, come here. <laughs> I mean, Just, as far as... Uh, <laughs> meow. Yeah. I mean, that was hot. It was like, oh, <laughs> okay. All right, so right now we have a little disagreement going on on the truck table. We welcome the conflict. Plays are still on sun. Maya Chinchia, what say you? <laughs> Well, hello. She actually gets to remember this kiss. I mean, the <laughs> Pavin yurt. I'm, I'm also a sucker for uh, the outdoors and a string of lights. That's all I really need. Um, so, you know, just the way he's encouraging her to think about herself among the, the collective that she's always thinking about. Oh, yeah, it's it's you know, it's it's sexy. So, yes, the outdoors. The light, mm -hmm. hitting, the blue. All right, all right. Claudia, needs of the many, needs of the few, needs of the one. What say you? Um, well, I, I got to say shout out to our Trek table audience because 100% I was getting under the sea vibes so hard. I was like, like, I felt like they were going to kiss before they were kissing because of like the lighting and stuff. I was like, oh, oh, well, it has to happen. It's sparkly and blue. And they're like, under the sea. <laughs> So yeah, really feeling that. <laughs> um, that said, um, I'm going to while while I'm fully feeling the love and happiness, super sexy Al Green vibes, because yes, that was so sexy. Commitment is what's sexy. Commitment is sexy. And that first one, he was like, you know what? We aren't gonna remember this, so this means nothing, and it meant nothing. And in this one, he's like, hey. I, this is real. It felt, and in fact, no, this was real and real because he was like, you know what, baby? I'm willing to like fully destroy the universe and let this war happen so we can be together. That's some commitment. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I want to support you, Claire. <laughs> romance, right? Ship wide romance. Uh, I want to support the, the party. I, I, that is one of my favorite episodes of this season. Uh, yes, and until that moment, that that kiss, that arm around the waist, super super sexy, wins the vote. But then we get to the yurt, and I will acknowledge <laughs> I fell prey to Tyler doing the whisper of "Come here." And if you have watched it, friends in the chat, friends on the audio podcast, friends at outpost13.org, if you watched it and you missed him mouth that, I invite you to go back, revisit. That's why I like Paramount+. Plus. I can go back and watch all the episodes I want as many times as I want for any reference point I need, be it kiss or otherwise. So, all right, we've had this moment. I want to acknowledge we're in the back part of thematics, and I'm going to take us out of the love and humor and desire spectrum that is the kiss question. And I'm going to ask us about these two women who unite to scream, to shout, and to try to help create this space. Um, last conversation right now about Laurel and uh, Cornwell. I mean, it's a brief alignment, but was anybody else surprised that's where we were going to go? I was fully ready to watch the blood drip uh, because she had all the tools in the Alice in Wonderland hallway. Um, I'm wondering, anyone want to share some thoughts on Laurel and Cornwell. Like, do we believe Laurel? Is she really going to do good in this defection? If it happens? I fully, this is Claudia, I fully believe Laurel because Laurel is a, a boss woman. She's a girl boss. She's making moves, she's making plans, and she's making sure she's got options. She's keeping her options open. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, anybody else? I do not believe Yeah, what her was it she said about is? misjudging her? Okay, so I hear Claire and then I hear Maya C. <laughs> Here's what I go. Claire, go. Misjudging her? I I don't believe her for a second. She comes from um she comes from a house of spies. She is a spy upon spy upon spy. 
she is out for no good and she has some underlying plan going on and she's trying to get on the discovery because she knows the discovery is the ship and i'm standing by that mm -hmm. okay my c go yes yeah that part that was the moment like that she specifically said the discovery because Cornwall is not the captain of the Discovery. You know, she happened to come directly from the Discovery at that moment. But at that point, I was like, wait, she's being a little crafty because uh, she wants to get on to the Discovery. But also, I, I what was that part about say, then when she said she misjudged her? I wasn't sure if that was for play for the, the, the Klingons that came in the hallway, I think it was Call, and, you know, his his uh, security homie and then you know pushing her up, up against the wall and it looks like she was electrocuted or something but she's still kind of alive um i don't know it's super dramatic i i'm not exactly sure what's next and where is this ship that she was like saying we could both get on and escape and defect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes so many thoughts last round claudia is that your exhale right here Oh, well, of course, I could, I could, I could talk about Laurel for a long time, because, again, I think that I like Laurel because I don't like Cole, and in comparison mm. to Cole, I'm like, I'm for you, Laurel. Like, I'm not against all Klingons. I like Klingons as a species. I want them to thrive. I just mm -hmm. don't like the jerk Klingons. So, like, I'm feeling Laurel, and I'm feeling Laurel's str strategic moves. Um, and I was actually deeply, I was curious as well. I was like, did she set this up? But then to see the way she's been attempting to maintain her power with Call and how that fully fails, I was like, I think she's just, I think she's attempting to keep every single option she could possibly have open. So mm -hmm. even though she comes from a family of spies and everybody's a spy, people are, she, I go, don't, don't blame her for being from a people of spies. Spies got to live too. Mm -hmm. All right. Spies got to live too. <laughs> Wisdom from the table again. Um, I'm going to go now to you, Maya Mama. Thoughts about this? We trust Laurel. Spies got to live. Where Where do you fall? I believe her uh, for other reasons that I want to get into later. Uh, but also I believe her. I think that this is um, enemy of my enemy type of situation. Um, it doesn't feel like this is a permanent alliance in any way, shape, or form. And that uh, Laurel is looking out for herself. Um but also I think that uh, that um, Cornwall understands that. That like, this doesn't mean that they're best friends, but they are gonna work together and it's gonna go. Mm -hmm. I, I will say that I was impressed. I was impressed that Laurel stepped up in this way. I don't know that I fully trust her yet, um, but you know, I agree. The spy is a spy is a spy is a spy. And watching her maneuver with Cornwell and then watching her maneuver with uh, Cole, I was like, all right, you're, I was like, yeah, you're shady, shady, but come on, rescue her so we can figure this out. So, um, yeah, eloquent as always, I know, but that was how I felt. <laughs> So I just want to say thank you for this section. I know there's some other stuff we're going to dig into when we get uh, to the, the Trek table question number three. We, we held off on some Stamets Colbert convo. And now we're kind of at that time that we always have to get to at the end of thematics where we want to go into the spoiler zone. So I want to say thank you so much to Maya for joining us. And just to say to our friends who are listening on the audio podcast, folks who are watching us on the video, whether you're live with us at twitch.tv slash outpost13 or at outpost13.org, we're going to do a five minute spoiler zone. So get ready. If you don't want to hear the spoilers, turn your volume down. If you're visually watching us, we'll wave you back. Uh, you'll also see in our agree spoiler zone, com uh, spoiler non zone comeback. And that's it. I'm going to stop counting it. So, Brandon, take us to the spoiler zone. All right, so here we are in the spoiler zone. If you are just joining us and still listening, three, two, one, we're about to jump in. Here we go. All right, I just wanted to say last week I didn't. Oh. Thank you, computer. Go. Last week I didn't get to talk about Space Whale and the Space Whale sushi that happened, so I just wanted to say I'm sad there was no Space Whale this week. 
But I was happy to see this new planet. So that's my jump into spoiler zone. Anybody else? I know Lorel, Lorel, Lorel. Come on. And Tyler. Yeah, come on. Know. Come on, Tyler, Tyler, like the irony of um, Michael being like, oh, we can't get together because your background is so wholesome and you're going to be fine, but I'm going to jail for the rest of my life. And I was like, this show rewards, this show rewards a rewatch. They were like, we're going to yeah. write this and you can watch it three times. All right, have a good time, That's audience. True. Well, and also um, there's this, uh, also Tyler has this big, dom dominant energy when we're speaking about like how he interacts romantically which is very very klingon klingons are really like and um and so it seems a little bit also i think that laurel is I think laurel is defecting and asking those questions about what they do to prisoners because of the bibi Oh. No, but also because of herself, because it's part of the plan. This is my thing. Mm -hmm. Is that her plan with Oak was that she was gonna go and get onto the Discovery as Tyler, and then she was gonna meet him on the Discovery and wake mm -hmm. Volk up. Like she yes. is supposed to go to the Discovery, wake Volk up, and then the two of them take over the Discovery. Um and then and then sail it back to the Klingons and say, Hey, we're the we're the um the big guys now because we, we got the we got the ship. Um so I don't think that I, I don't think that she was ever on Cornwall's side. I don't think it was ever an alliance. I think it was just a way to get onto Discovery. Mm. I agree. And I Mm -hmm. And can I just say that I was wait? I, I mean, all the things we know now, I understand writing wise why they didn't tell it. But come on, when he touched the Pavin stones, the Pavin didn't sense he's Klingon grafted onto no, human. No, they did sense he's Klingon because they brought him to um, to the conflict between um, Saru and Burnham, and and I think they knew he was a Klingon, and, and that was their first attempt. It's like, look, here's a Klingon, and here's some, and here's a human, and some Federation people. Here, get together and talk. And then, and then I think that's also why they thought it was okay to bring the Klingons and the humans together because the humans were already with the Klingon. Mm. Maybe I'm overthinking yeah, this. Uh, the Pavans don't—they don't communicate in the same way that uh, that everyone else does, and so they don't have a way of being like, "He's a Klingon, so talk to him," because he's a Klingon too. Um, Mazel Tov! Wow. That was exciting. That was I don't know what just happened. Yeah, that's great. Can I celebrate it? Um, Opa, we should say. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and I want to say I'm seeing some questions in the chat. Um, we don't necessarily, the show has not explained the Vogue situation. So for folks asking about that. And yeah, we're not sure if the Pavins are like Deanna Choi. We don't know that they're empaths. Someone was just talking about how they communicate in a different way. Was that you, Maya Mama? Yeah. They, well, it seems like what they do is they sort of like re-experience our memories and read our minds a little bit mm -hmm. um, to just try to get a sense of who a person is, I guess, get their energy, mm -hmm. like yeah, sense their really energy and stuff so that they can like be on the same wavelength as far as communication. But they don't, but it's not like they're getting everybody's life story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I just say also that I want to just... Tilly's captain journey to the controversial questions of season three. I feel like, yeah, watching her this season, I'm like, yeah, dude, she stepped up to Saru. She stepped up to Stamets. She's trying to be about this. She, She's not afraid, even though we meet her. And I feel like I was coded to expect her to not be a good communicator. But she's an amazing communicator. Like, I'm really surprised in this rewatch. And then I'll just say, Mm, Stamets, you're giving me complexity right now because you don't want to tell your boo what's happening because you don't want to mess with his rank and stuff. So I I'm well, feeling some that. Some of that feels like some nonsense, though. I'll be honest. I'm like, I don't mm. understand how you can have a star a starship that runs like this. I guess you can only have it when it's being run by somebody from the Mirror Universe who does not care about anything. Because this ship mm. is doing some stuff where I'm like, like, that's not how starships work. This isn't Discovery not understanding how you write Star Trek. This is them breaking rules on purpose. Yes, mm -hmm. I agree. Absolutely. Because, um, yeah, because Lorca just doesn't, he does not give two shits about what people are doing yes. interpersonally. Oh. And we're right back to go to Mirror, so. Mm -hmm. oh. 
Ooh, I can't yes, wait. yes, yes. I can't wait. I'm so excited. Yeah. <laughs> Feels like they're really right. setting him up to seem like a hero, though, in this episode. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. All Agreed. Right. So I'm going to wave. I'm going to wave back. Transfer of data is complete. Thank you. All right. So we had a very fascinating spoiler zone conversation. As folks move your way through the series, we invite you to come back and listen to the audio podcast so you can catch up on all our spoiler comments. Um, and we just want to say thank you so much. Welcome back, Maya Chinchia and all the listeners um, on the podcast, also, also on the video. Welcome back. And, you know, those are a just some of the many thoughts that we have had on thematics today for Star Trek Discovery Season 1, Episode 8. And as we head into our final Trek table question number three, we will hear a little bit more of our Trek, Holland Beck Gonzo from the band Quetzal, as we ponder this. What is your opinion on Lieutenant Stamets' decision to not tell Dr. Culber, both his doctor and his partner about his spore drive side effect related episodes. What's your opinion? All right, my friends, what were you, what's your take on Lieutenant Stamets' decision to not tell Dr. Culber, both his doctor and his partner, about his spore drive side effects? Let's go real quick. Maya Mama, what's your take? I think that it was uh, the wrong thing to do for absolutely the right reason. Uh, Dr. Culber would, uh, he would keep it secret and he would, it would cost him his uh, entire career. I think that they, that, that they know each other very well. And uh, it was also the wrong choice. You don't keep things from your partner. Oh, that's super useful. But I would have um, done I mean, it. You would have done it. Ooh. All right, Maya, how about you? Uh, 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 we've just heard from Maya Mama. Maya. Uh, yes, Maya here. Yeah, I, I can understand the wanting to protect your partner, but I would just wanted to scream at the screen, Stamets, you better tell your partner. Let Culver decide what to do with that information. I mean, he's going to find out later on, and he's going to get mad at you. So, you know, and isn't there some sort of doctor patient partner privilege? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's actually a really good question. What is the HIPAA code, the Starfleet HIPAA code? This is something that they don't tell us about. Um, Dela, what's your take on this? On, on what's uh, your take on what Culber did? I will say I was surprised. It feels like one of the first selfless things I have seen Stamets do in this series, even though it could be conceived of as selfless to be poked with the tardigrade, but I think he wants to commune with the mushroom. So that ultimately was a selfish act. So I actually will say I would have pro I would have made the choice to talk to Daddy Culber because I would make that choice. But I respect that he's trying to to care for someone besides himself. Um, and that he heard Tilly. A hundred and Andy heard Tilly. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm loving that our audience is actually having a little bit of a back and forth about this as well. It's the same back and forth I had on my first watch. I was really judgmental. I was like, you're you did wrong. I would be mad if I was your partner and you did that. I'd be really mad at you. And then and I was like, and that was a selfish choice. And then I realized uh, actually that was him trying to be selfless. I don't know if he did it right, but I see, I see now where it's coming from. So I want to thank um, all of those assembled here at the Trek table and all of those in the audience for helping me understand Stamets' journey a little bit more. And that takes us to the end of Trek table question number three. All right, welcome back. All right, we are in the back nine of this Trek Table episode 009. Thank you all for staying with us. So we strive to hold space for Black, Indigenous, Brown, women of color. And we want to um, amplify resources and highlight the work of women of color content creators, community builders, and world changers. Maya, can I have you share our first signal boost for the day? Sure. Black imagination is a Black voices. Ooh, I need my, my green tea. Black Voices on Black Futures by Natasha Marin. I actually need a little bit of help. Great, I will take that for you. Yes, go, Claudia. Oh, 
Okay, I'll read it. Black Imagination, Black Voices on Black Futures by Natasha Marin. Tony and Grammy Award winner <laughs> David Diggs and Emmy Award winner Lena Waithe are set to narrate the audio book production of viral conception artist Natasha Marin's Black Imagination. Diggs, Waithe, and Marin have joined forces with reading platform Scribd with reading platform Scribd for the audiobook production that will amplify and bring the voices of black children, black youth, the black LGBTQ plus community, unsheltered black people, incarcerated black people, and others to life through their narration. More information at www.black-imagination.com. Yes, and um, I'm going to amplify a friend of the show, super excited, Elisa Pearl, who is on the Outpost 13 network uh, as the captain of the Improvised Generation, also has an amazing show, um, and she and her crew for the Blood of the Void will be back live tomorrow night, the third Monday of the month. Uh, that would be Monday, March 29th, 2021. Uh, Blood of the Void is an actual playing tabletop RPG. Uh, you use And it uses Star Trek Adventures um, as a game. And it's by Modifis Entertainment. And uh, we invite you to go and check out this show. Join this all Klingon cast as they adventure through the voids of space. Uh, GM'd by Elisa Pearl. These are BIPOC stories in a Klingon context. And I can't wait to see what the next adventure is. Uh, you can check out our chat or the episode notes for the link, or you can follow them at Blood Void RPG on Twitter and Instagram, and check their uh, live broadcast tomorrow night here on twitch.tv slash Q times, Q-U-E-U-E-T-I-M-E-S at 6.30 PST. Um, yes. And because it's a fun day, I'm going to stay in this uh, queue and I'm going to go ahead and read the last signal boost for the day. As Maya, I want to invite you to just throw that, uh, coat that throat. You got it. Uh, so the last thing I want to say is we invite folks on Friday, April 2nd, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific time for the Black Spec Lit Anthology Launch and Readings Fundraiser. It's a celebratory evening of readings to launch a community-supported anthology of Black speculative literary arts. The anthology will be a collection of speculative short stories from various members of the Afro Surreal Writers Workshop of Oakland, the Association of Black and Brown Writers, Voodoo Knots Fellows, and Vona Alumni. It's titled New Transmissions from the Dark Fantastic Continuum, Collective Works from New Voices. Get your tickets at the URL inside of our chat or um, in our show notes. And uh, if you have a content, if you have content that you want us to uh, bump or you know a woman of color content creator that we should amplify, please feel free to reach out to us. DM us at Trek Table on Instagram or Trek Table One on Twitter. And those were all of the beautiful signal boosts for this Trek Table episode nine. All right, we've made it to these final thoughts. Thank you all so much for joining us for this ninth episode of The Trek Table. And as is the case every week, we share our final thoughts for this episode. So I'm gonna invite you to go first, Claire. Uh, final thoughts for Star Trek Discovery Season 1, Episode 8? Um, I know we're already eight episodes in, so a lot of people have forgotten. But for everybody who is a cheering on Laurel, Laurel was a disciple of Takuvma, and Takuvma was a racial purist and a nationalist. So the idea that uniting the Klingons, you know, that, that may sound really historically wonderful, but it is done in a context of nationalism and racial purity, uh, not to mention authoritarianism, three aspects of what in our world is uh, generally called fascism. Uh, so be really, really careful about cheering on Laurel and Volk um, and their house because they are um, actually still disciples of Takuvma and his, um, and his ideas. And these were presented uh, three years ago in 2017 in the wake of um, Trump's election because of the rise of nationalism, not just in the United States, but all over the world that we've been seeing for the past four or five years. So keep an eye on that for yourself and also historically. Thank you, Claire. Maya Mama, your final thought for this episode? 
Um, I guess my my final thought is that Pav and Kiss, uh, it, it was wonderful, and I recommend that everybody go on to Paramount Plus and like just watch it a, just a couple of times. It's a uh, it's quite rewarding, <laughs> and uh, and quite enjoyable, and uh, and also uh, absolutely one hundred percent yes to what Claire said. Uh, we we tend to forget that bad guys are bad guys. Thank you. Uh, Maya C, how's your throat? What say you? Final thought of the episode? It's okay. It's coming back. I told you I've been having a little bit of issues with um, asthma and allergies. But yes, um, ooh, it makes my throat a little bit scratchy. Maybe that's a sexy thing. Um, I, I just can't wait till um, I feel safe and without fear to be able to uh, visit places respectfully, respectfully respecting the native peoples um, and their wishes. But I really, I really could use a break and would like to go back, go, go to Pavo. Um, yeah. And hang out there for a little while in a hammock near the crystal <laughs> tower. Okay. We want a hammock outside the crystal tower. Claudia, what say you final thoughts on this episode of season one, episode eight? I've been thinking a lot about the moment it's around it's actually around the same time as this kiss right it's the it's the moment where um um burnham says oh i don't get when this war is over you get to go home i go to jail for the rest of my life and i keep forgetting that michael burnham is fighting for everyone in the knowledge that at the end of this fight she's going to be jailed for the rest of hers and and I just I'm I'm gonna be carrying that and watching it with that lens for the rest of this season, just because that feels um, really interesting for her character. All right, um, I'm just gonna say that I my final thought of this episode is it makes me want to watch Discovery more and more and more because now that I've seen this moment, I will say watching Saru again have. Uh, Kelpian level strength and speed was fascinating. Um, yes to all these observations about the Klingons. Um, it's a beautifully restored cathedral-like ship, the sarcophagus, but it's still a fascist ship. And it brings with it cloaking technology, secrets, and uh, peop uh, beings that want to control other beings so um as one of our folks is saying in the ch in the chat it is a little bit like make chronos great again um but i am on this journey for with the klingons so i'm, I'm curious about it and i guess the last thing i want to say is i am just ever grateful that i would never have guessed that a kiss in a yurt would be the hottest thing I feel like I've seen in the week. So thank you, Kristen Beyer and all of the folks over at Star Trek Discovery <laughs> and amazing work uh, by these actors. There's some great notes in Memory Alpha about this episode and just some of the production conditions uh, the cast and the crew were dealing with as they were filming some of these favorite scenes that we've been talking about. So. We haven't said it all, but we've said a lot. And I just want to say thank you to everybody who stuck with us today um, as our transmitter uh, had varying degrees of su <laughs> subspace success. Um, and we just want to say thank you. Uh, those are our final thoughts on season one, episode eight, C. V. Pasham Parabellum. Thank you all for joining us for Trek Table. And please don't forget to sign up for our mailing list at trektablepodcast.com. Yes, and you can continue to support us on patreon.com slash trektable. And we want to just say thank you to everybody for liking and subscribing us on Instagram and Facebook at trektable or on Twitter at trektable1. You can join our convos uh, using hashtag trektable, hashtag B-I-W-O-C trek, and hashtag Star Trek Discovery. And I'm so excited. You can find our Trek Table podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and wherever you get your podcasts. So listen to all of them. 
Yes, yes. Episodes one through seven up now. I just want to say thank you as we close out this episode. I want to share gratitude to Claudia Alec, Maya Chinchilla, and our guest host today, Maya Mills Lowe, a.k.a. Maya Mama, and Claire Light, uh, pen name J.D. Jang. We want to say thank you for sharing all of your thoughts and insights with us today. Thanks to everybody joining us in the chat. I just want to close out this ritual and say all that time ago we started. We were holding truck space for voting rights and protests and the ways that we can come together and the way that current students, alums, and staff um, who are fighting tooth and nail to keep their college um, on the Ohlone land in Oakland, uh, shouts out and love to all the folks at Mills fighting that fight. We also want to hold space for those who live in fear daily. We've talked about what it was like for Saru to leave it, but there are people living every day in a constant state of fear and we hold, we hold truck space for you. We also want to acknowledge that it is Passover, so we send love and greetings for uh, throughout the world to our friends who uh, and family who celebrate and observe that. We're holding check space for folks with larger feelings that don't seem to fit in small canals or come out the way that you want, and anybody who has large feelings and thoughts and issues that you can't figure out. Um, we also want to hold check space for anybody who's looking for peace, even amidst feelings of war. Uh, creating peace within oneself might be the way to go. And we're holding check space for anybody who feels like the bridge crew, like you've, you're inadequate to an impossible task. We're holding check space for all of those things and more. And um, I just want to say thank you. And this show would not be this show if um, tech decided not to work for me in this last set of moments. <laughs> we would like to thank the Truck Table production team, executive producers, Allison De La Cruz, Luz Minda Jarwala, production coordinator, Brandon Chang, artist coordinator, Terry Hashimoto, social media manager, Isil Borlasa, and stage manager, Ariana Michelle. And deep gratitude and deep thanks to Outpost 13 and their parent organization Outside in Theater. With extra thanks to Jessica, Paul, Matt, Arlo, and Alex. Thanks also to Geekish Network, our exclusive partner on Clubhouse. Thanks to Francis Collado and Visual Communications. And thanks to all of our friends across the Star Trek universes. Yes, and finally, the deepest, thickest thanks to you, the folks following us and joining us uh, on twitch.tv slash outpost13. Our friends who still might be able to see us on outpost13.org and those of you listening to the podcast. Thank you so much for showing up for this conversation centering on women of color. Check Table is a service mark of De La Projects, LLC. Thank you all for coming to this ed uh, edition of the Trek Table. So let's close out this ritual today. All the things and all the moments. We want to say thank you for coming. Go ahead, take one more big breath in. And one more big breath out. Thank you all so much for joining us at the Trek Table. We look forward to holding Trek space for you again soon. Have a great week. Bye.